All right, so I already know roughly what I'm going to see here, but there you have it, 194.2. All right, so to continue on, uh, I'm going to be doing this as I'm working on meal prep. You can see here I've got a round of chicken helper that I'm about to make shortly, as well as uh, I've got some vegetables roasting in the oven currently. And if I can do this one-handed without, oh god, oh god, this is all going so poorly all of a sudden. <laughs> oh, it hurts to be stupid. Okay, so I've got this. Um, I think I got it from Kroger. I'm going to make this, and I've got, um, in the oven right now, roasting is a roughly diced onion, uh, some frozen crinkle cut carrots, and frozen cauliflower and broccoli. And I was just gonna throw that in with that beef tray thing and use the, the sauce, gravy, whatever you wanna call it, that the beef comes with as like a sauce for the vegetables and just have it all together. I'm not gonna do any rice or pasta or bread or anything. It's just going to be the vegetables and the beef and the gravy. So that's one. Um, I'm probably going to get two or three meals out of that. And then here with the chicken helper, you can see I've got one box of chicken helper, but then four big ass cans of chicken. Is this the healthiest way to do things? Hell the fuck no. But it's cheap <laughs> and shelf stable. Doesn't take up room in the fridge. So I bought, like, a massive fucking box of these and of these. So I'm just gradually working through that shit. And as much as it's not healthy because, you know, this shit is full of whatever preservatives, additives, any kind of ifs that you can think of, um, still, you know, I've got... This is a lot of fucking chicken for one box of that shit. Plus, I've got some mushrooms, some cannellini beans, and I'm going to put nutritional yeast in it. I'm also going to put some frozen mixed vegetables in there. It's just like peas, carrots, green beans, and corn, and an onion. I'm going to saute an onion before I throw the rest of the shit in. So it's not going to be the worst thing ever. It's definitely going to be high protein. There's going to be vegetables and beans and mushrooms in it and everything. Um, but still, you know, it's... It's still chicken helper. It's not like a nice home-cooked meal with fresh ingredients or whatever. So, uh, you know, not necessarily something I would advise as, like, the ideal, of course. I think that much is probably obvious. But if you're broke and you don't have a lot of fridge space and you're lazy as fuck and you don't know what else to do, it better this than fast food. <laughs> And that's kind of what I do meal prep for, to be honest, is for the convenience of it, because I'm an exceptionally lazy person. Um, and what happens a lot of the times is if I get off work in the morning or I'm waking up in the evening, because uh, I work nights, um, and I don't have anything cooked, there's nothing like convenient around, I'm not going to cook. I just woke up or I just got off work or whatever. I don't feel like fucking cooking. I'm not doing that shit. <laughs> And so I would just end up getting fast food before... I'm going to check on my vegetables real quick. Yeah, before I would just... Wow, that's a lot of steam. I would just probably resort to fast food in a situation like that, purely out of convenience's sake. Because when I first wake up, I'm hungry as shit, and I don't feel like doing anything. Like, I wake up starving as a motherfucker, and of course, low energy and everything. I don't get great sleep to begin with. That's something I really need to work on. Um... So yeah, when I first wake up, I'm not about to fucking cook anything. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so if I don't have meal preps waiting in the fridge or like my overnight oats or anything, then I'm probably just going to go out and grab something real quick. Either fast food or like snacks from the gas station. And both of those are pretty much the worst case scenario. Like those, those two options are like one step above just sitting down and eating sugar cubes. <laughs> or eating sugar out of a bag with a spoon. Like, it's bad. So, yeah, meal preps help me avoid that. Um, and they're only... I mean, it doesn't take that much longer than cooking a single meal. Um, the volumes are higher, but you're processing everything all at the same time. 
So I don't feel like it costs me that much more time in total. There is definitely more time spent on it, but I don't think it's even double what I would spend cooking a single meal versus how much time I spend cooking four meals all at once. And so I feel like I save myself a lot of time and effort and I can just get all of that shit done in one day and, and not fucking think about it for the rest of the week versus spending more time, but like broken up throughout the week, just repeatedly cooking something and then doing dishes or whatever. Like aside from, I, I need to get like a slotted spoon or something. But aside from that, the, the fucking lid, the pot, whatever slotted spoon I get and the meal prep trays, and of course forks to eat them with later is all the fucking dishes this is going to create versus if i if i cooked you know like a homemade like chicken soup or whatever but i cooked a single portion of it at a time every day i'd be washing a pot and a spoon and whatever i eat out of every day um so again i really think that this in the long run saves you a lot of time and effort as much as it feels daunting to cook a huge batch of shit all at once, you know, it, I, it's definitely easier for me than cooking a smaller batch every fucking day. I just do it once or twice a week, more realistically, like twice a week. And that's it. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a part-timer at the factory that I work at because they just, they start everyone off part-time and then you move to full-time eventually. And I just haven't been there long enough yet. And this is Tuesday. I'm off tonight. So this is my night off, and so I'm doing the beef tray thing. I've got a batch of my overnight oats already in the fridge, and then I'm doing my chicken helper shit. Uh, oh, right, right, right. Uh, maybe not today, but at some point, I'm going to do another batch of my pasta salad, which I might, like, just film that when I do. Um, you know, assuming my roommate isn't home because I would be fucking horribly embarrassed to be talking to my phone, <laughs> a random YouTube audience that doesn't necessarily exist as my roommate is like in the other room listening to me babble. Um, so yeah, if I, <laughs> whenever I do that, whether it's later today or like sometime tomorrow or whatever, I might film that just because I think I like my pasta salad recipe a lot. I think it's really easy and simple and it clearly works for me um, because I've been eating it a lot in the past couple of weeks and you saw the scale, so you can't lie. You can't argue with that. It's just a bunch of vegetables and beans and I use pasta that is, I've been using red lentil pasta just because I have it. I usually just use um, protein plus from, and please excuse me Italians, I assume it's Berea, or is it Barilla? I don't know. Americans probably call it Barilla, but I'm sure that's not how it's pronounced. Yeah, they have protein plus quote-unquote pasta that I use usually, but I just happen to have a couple boxes of the red lentil stuff, which is has slightly better macros, but I don't like the texture and taste as much. It's a little bit grittier. Um, so yeah, uh, a protein-enriched pasta with just a shitload of vegetables <laughs> and olive oil, lemon juice, salt and pepper, and Italian herbs. The, the vegetables in particular that I'll use, I'll chop up some fresh spinach, um, an onion, some bell peppers, English cucumber, and tomatoes. And yeah, I'll throw in some cannellini beans in there. Um, I think that's just about it. It's really simple, really easy, really fast. Um, all you're cooking is the pasta. Aside from that, it's just chopping a bunch of vegetables and then you mix it all up and you're done. You just portion it out if you're going to do that. Otherwise, you put it in a big old fucking container and just dip out of it as you go. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what I'm going to be eating this week. My overnight oats, the beef tray thing, my chicken helper, and then pasta salad, which I'm going to have to... I don't have anything on hand, but I need to buy either frozen chicken breast or frozen shrimp. I haven't decided which one I want yet. And I'm just going to, you know, like broil that or whatever, saute it in a pan to have with the pasta salad just to get it, you know, per meal more protein. I've been having like, for example, I had tilapia fillets. I'm out now. But just this morning I had a tilapia fillet. It just broiled with salt and pepper and a, a smaller serving of the pasta salad. Um, 
so yeah, I've been eating like that, and <laughs> that's a, that's a glimpse into how I'm going to be eating for the foreseeable future. Aside from that, I don't really snack anymore. Aside from occasionally, I will have a banana um, just to make sure I'm getting potassium. And then, in addition to that, um, when I go to work, I don't take a real lunch. I take a protein shake, which is, I've got my protein powder up here. It's just Walmart brand fucking chocolate protein powder. Um, okay, so protein powders use two different scoop sizes. Most of them use a scoop that is 15 grams of protein versus, like... Um, 75 to 90 calories. That one up there uses a big old fucking double scoop. So one scoop of that is 30 grams of protein and I think 170 calories. So I'll put one of those scoops into two fluid ounces of 2% milk. It doesn't necessarily need to be 2%. That's just what my roommate uses. And so that's what I buy because I don't want to be like buying a different kind of milk that he doesn't want to use or whatever. <laughs> so two fluid ounces of 2% milk, one big old scoop of that, um, a fucking heaping tablespoon of peanut butter, just regular old creamy peanut butter, nothing special, throw that in there, and then just add enough water so that it becomes drinkable, but just barely, I like my shakes kind of thick, I'll take that to work with a pair of these uh, light cheese sticks, they're, you know, different brands or whatever, but, like, one of these sticks is 50 calories and 6 grams of protein, if I remember correctly. So, yeah, I'll grab two of those and my protein shake, which is the way I make it with the peanut butter and the milk and everything. I think it's, like, let's see, 270, probably around, like, 400-ish calories for one of those protein shakes. It's a, it's a chunky boy, but it's fucking delicious. And it's still less calories than, like, you know, an average meal for me is going to run, like, 500 to 600. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I've been losing weight. Like, when I wake up in the evening, I'll have my overnight oats, and that's, like, 500 to 600 calories for, like, 50 to 60 grams of protein. Um, and then at work, I'll have that protein shake. That's another 45-ish grams. The two cheese sticks... That's plus 12, so 57 grams of protein against, like, 500 to 600 calories, again, <laughs> um, while I'm at work. And then I come home, and before I pass the fuck out, I have another meal, which, in the case of the tilapia filet and uh, pasta salad, probably closer to, like, 400 calories, maybe even less, but still, like, 30-something grams of protein, probably. Um, so, yeah, that's... That's a, a, a whole fucking day, an average day in the life. I may add a banana to that. That's another, let's say, 120 calories or something. Not really any protein, like a gram or two. And that'll be it. So, yeah, I'm running. I probably, I probably undercount. I'm positive I undercount somewhere. Um, I'm probably putting more oil in my pasta salad than I account for or whatever. Um, so, on paper... Theoretically, I'm doing like 1,600, 1,700 a day, something like that. In practicality, it's probably closer to 2,000 or slightly above just because I don't actually weigh all my shit out at the moment. I used to, and that's definitely the smarter way to do things. If you're having trouble, that's the first thing I'm going to fucking suggest is that you count every fucking thing that has a single calorie that you put into your body in any way, shape, or form. And you count it by putting it on a fucking scale. <laughs> and that will show you where you are fucking up. As long as you're being honest with yourself. There's a lot of people that just straight up fucking lie to themselves. Like they'll get like a sweet tea or whatever. And they're like, oh, it's just a sweet tea. It can't be that much. It's better than soda, blah, blah, blah. They won't count it. And that's a fucking problem because that motherfucker probably isn't better than soda. It's probably got 300, 400 fucking calories in it. More even if you're ordering like a large from a fast food restaurant. And you're just not counting that. And that's why you are having no success is because you're not being honest with yourself. Um, or just like, you know, even if you, even if you snack on like a little dark chocolate square and some grapes or whatever... That used to be one of my favorite snacks. I know damn well that a single dark chocolate square is like 80, 60 to 80 calories. 
And then the grapes, if you have like a, a decent handful, it might be about the same as well on top of that. So you're adding like at least a quarter, if not half of a whole nother fucking meal to your day with that one snack. You need to count everything. There are no empty calories, free calories, whatever. I don't care if it's a five calorie fucking thing. If you are not having any success, the fact that you aren't counting that is a huge part of why. Um, anyways, rant over, tangent done with. I'm not even high right now. I'm just this dumb sober. I'm sorry. Um, bear with me here. Uh, so, what have I been up to outside of the food side of the equation? Which, to be honest, is like 95% of weight loss. If I'm going to be fucking real with you. Um, Exercise-wise, I've been doing a lot of thinking and half acidly like trying to learn some more shit watching a lot of dr mike <laughs> you know dr mike israel um renaissance periodization i can't talk right now i'm sorry let me try that again renaissance periodization there you go it's it's a multi-syllabic word and i've got one brain cell here you're gonna have to fucking give me a little credit um i'm overclocking that shit so <laughs> Yeah, watching some of his videos, or like um, Pavel Tsatulin, uh, he's he's a good resource too. He's he's a fucking legend, um, particularly in like the realm of like kettlebell shit. Um, just trying to learn from guys like that. Um, in particular, you know, I I see my training as having multiple facets, and I think a lot of people think of like weights and cardio as like the two big like binary categories and then within weights you've got either training with a focus on hypertrophy which is just you know adding muscle mass and then training purely for strength and there's some overlap between the two but you can definitely gear your program to focus on one more than the other for sure and then cardio is a separate thing and then that's it and I feel like a lot of people overlook the concept of muscular endurance, or what I like to call endurance of strength. Because I think even when you say muscular endurance, people are still thinking cardio. I'm not talking about cardio. Um, I'm talking about shit like, for example, at my last job before this one, there was one day where me and one other new guy got tasked with the shit duty of shoveling a massive pile of scraps of raw fat and skin that had been trimmed off of the pork thighs because it was a ham factory. And this pile, I swear to God, okay, so we were shoveling it into a container that is about as like wide and long as this oven, but kind of halfway between the oven and the fridge in terms of height. So imagine a box that when you look down into it, it's about this big, except for you're looking into it from like up here somewhere, like big ass fucking box. And we filled it with that pile of the fucking raw scraps of random shit cut off of the hams. So it was, it was a lot. We were at it for a hot minute. And the thing is, like, you know, you, you get one shovel full of that shit, you throw it in there, and you're like, oh, that's not so bad. Well, you keep fucking doing that without stopping, you know, about as fast as you can manage because, of course, supervisors at that job were rabid. They were on your ass constantly for anything. So you're doing that about as fast as you can without stopping for a couple hours or some shit. I don't think it took us a couple hours. I think it was more like one. But still, that shit starts to get fucking heavy eventually. Um, and that's what I'm talking about. Or, for example, a ruck march. For those of you who have been in the military or know somebody who's been in the military, for the latter category, ask your veteran buddies... How much it sucks to be in what they call full battle rattle. So that's your your armor, your helmet, your boots, your fucking your rifle, your ammunition, your water, your rations, your camping gear, whatever. All of it piled up on you. We're talking 80 to 120 pounds of gear, depending on your job. And you're like jogging multiple miles through shit terrain. That fucking sucks, and it's not just cardio. It will kill you in terms of cardio, but it's going to kill you in terms of the rest of your fucking body, too. And it's not because those people can't lift 120 pounds. They can lift 120 pounds. It's carrying it at a jog for three, 
four or five fucking hours straight. That's the hard part. So that's kind of my thing. That's kind of what I've been looking into is this idea of training for strength endurance, endurance of strength, muscular endurance, whatever you want to call it. I don't know if there's an actual term for it. There probably is, but I'm dumb as fuck, so I don't know it. Um, <laughs> see, the thing is, I like the idea of that being a sort of specialty of mine. Um, because first of all, you're dealing more with slow twitch muscle fibers. Those of you who know the difference between slow twitch and fast twitch, you're dealing more with the slow twitch at that rate, which have less growth potential than the fast twitch, which for me is good because I don't want to look big. Like I'm a, I'm standing here in a fucking crop top and tiny little shorts. Okay. Like, look, I've got, well, I've got bruised as fuck shins, but I've got little chicken legs and they're shaved and my fucking nails are polished and I'm sitting here in a fucking crop top. Like, I don't want to look like Schwarzenegger in the 80s, okay? Like, even if I do consider myself male and I have a, a bad fucking habit of being into straight women, regardless, I don't want the muscle head look. Um, so hypertrophy is something that I definitely don't gear my training towards. And in fact, if I could, like, maximize my strength gains while minimizing hypertrophy, I would do that in a heartbeat. Because I, I like the, like, wayfish sort of elven build. Like, think Griffith from Berserk is essentially what I would be going for. Of course, I wouldn't... <laughs> I would like to keep my moral compass, whatever's left of it. Um, but appearance-wise, that's what I'm talking about here. Um, so, fuck. I don't even remember how I got started. Oh, right, right, right. Um, so you're dealing with your slow twitch fibers. They have less growth potential. You're not going to lower chance of ending up totally fucking jacked and stacked to the goddamn nines. Um, I still, I want better, like, raw strength training. Like, legit strength training like you would get for powerlifting or strongman or whatever is just different from muscular endurance. Like, dudes that can carry 120 pounds for fucking six hours may not be able to bench 300. Um, and a guy who can bench 300 plus may not be able to carry 120 pounds for six hours. Like, they're just different avenues of conditioning. Um, and so I feel like you kind of got to do both if you want to be rounded. And especially me, considering, like, I do Muay Thai and BJJ, I feel like I would be missing out on having a bit of an advantage if I just had greater potential for, like, straight-up force generation. You know, like, that low rep, low set, heavy as fuck weight kind of training where you're just stacking plates on the bar and you're you're about to fucking give birth every time you do a rep. Like, that kind of training is what gives you force generation. Uh, that's what conditions you to just straight up produce the much force throughout a movement as possible. Um, which is not necessarily what you're doing with strength endurance. With strength endurance, you're not using as much force per movement, but you're doing that movement consistently over a long period of time or many reps. Um, and like I said, I think you really ought to have both, um, at least in terms of like a practical standpoint. Because, you know, I, I work in a factory, so strength endurance is something that is especially relevant for me um, in terms of just like, I want my job to be easier. I want to be less tired and sore when I come home and the thinking is, perhaps, that if I'm less tired and sore when I get home, then it's easier for me to recover from work, and work doesn't interfere with my training schedule as much. Like, I can do my traditional strength workouts, I can go to my MMA classes and whatever, I can run, and I don't have to worry so much about, like, you know, timing it on, like, my days off, or a Friday or something when I know, like, oh, I don't have to go to work tomorrow, so this would be a good day for me to train so that when I go to work day after tomorrow, I won't be sore anymore. I don't want to have to worry about that anymore. And so if I can get to the point where my job is just totally fucking mundane to me in terms of, like, its effect on my physicality, then that just gives me even more, like, capacity to further my training outside of work is the idea. I don't know if it actually works that way. I'm not a personal trainer. Please don't take anything I say as gospel or like good advice or like, you know, consultation from any sort of medical professional. <laughs> this is just my thinking for my own bullshit and what I've been up to. 
just just sharing what's happening with me. So, you know, take take everything I say with a few pounds of salt here. Um, so yeah, I feel like I want to focus on the strength endurance side of things. So I've been doing, for example, like calisthenics works out, workouts. Fuck, I can't talk. I think I might have like a mild stutter or something because I do that a lot. Um, but yeah, I'll do like single leg calf raises. So like just lift this foot up so it's not in play and then do your calf raise on the other foot. Um, I'll do that on both sides for a set of 25 per side, five sets. And I'll be doing like push-ups with a backpack on that's got 35 pounds of water bottles in it. <laughs> and I'll do those 25, five sets. And like, you know, the whole workout, you know, lunges are in there too. Again, with the backpack and also with my ammo boxes that are filled with shotgun shells and nine millimeter. So they're quite heavy too. Um, and again, these are not huge weights, like a 35 pound pack and a couple ammo boxes. I can lift a lot more than that, but I mean, for 25 reps, fucking five sets. Yeah. At the end of that, you are dying. Um, <laughs> And so shit like that is what I've been doing. Um, I've got the, the push-ups, the lunges, the calf raises, um, tib raises, tibialis raises. If you haven't done that before, check into it. It's really good if you're trying to get into running to prevent shin splints. Um, glute bridges, sit-ups, leg raises, uh, dips, um, you know, close grip push-ups, diamond push-ups, triangle push-ups, whatever you want to call them. Shit like that. All of those, like high reps... Lots of sets with some weight added because I'm at the point where body weight is just not really challenging to me anymore. If I did just, you know, regular fucking lunges without a backpack on or anything, five sets of 25 would be nothing. I wouldn't feel that. Um, you know, not to brag, I, I'm fucking tiny now, so it's not like I have a whole lot of body weight to work with as it is. Um... <laughs> Or uh, pull-ups, pull-ups too. I've been doing a lot of pull-ups because I wanted to increase the number that I can do and also increase the weight that I can do them with. I think there's a part of me that's still paranoid that one day this is all going to come crashing down and I'm going to gain all my weight back. And I would hate to not be able to do pull-ups anymore because I really don't have any other way to train my back right now unless I want to do bent over rows. But I'm kind of scared of bent over rows because like, if your technique isn't really good, you're going to fuck your back up. And I just don't want to fuck with that. I, I would rather just do the fucking pull-ups instead. So I've been doing the pull-ups with the backpack on too. Um, at least trying to. I can only manage like a couple reps. And then I'm out for that set. So I'm trying to push my limit there. That's one of my big priorities. The other big priority is I do want to see some hypertrophy on just my lower body. Like glutes, quads, hamstrings, to a lesser extent calves. I would like to see some muscle growth there, um, but the way that I'm eating in a deficit right now, and I'm doing, you know, all the fucking running and MMA classes and work in a factory and everything, like, I don't think I'm going to have much luck actually putting any muscle on until I am actually unironically thinking about, like, later kind of towards mid to late fall or even early winter starting at my first ever legit bulk cycle. Um, at which point I will be training for hypertrophy until that cycle is over with, <laughs> at which point I'll go back to purely training for strength and strength endurance and cardio <laughs> and just try to preserve whatever muscle I gained while, um, you know, peeling off the fat that I would have gained during the bulk cycle. I'll have to see how that goes. Um, you know, it's, it's always a dangerous game to have my eating under control and everything. And then to go back and purposefully gain weight and then be faced with the prospect of losing it again. That's going to mess with my head a little bit. I'm positive. Um, but I'm feeling confident that I might be able to handle the challenge because I already had a moment where I moved up here and I gained back like 20 to 30 pounds and then I lost it again, and now I'm back down to lower than I was before. So I feel like I might be able to pull it off. So I'm really thinking about that. Otherwise, my goals at the moment, I have a few. I feel like they're fairly simple. A long-term goal, definitely not a short-term one, because I am honestly weak as fuck. 
but a long-term goal is I, I would like to join the 1,000 pound club, they call it, for weightlifting, which is if you total the amount of weight that, I mean, first of all, you know what a one rep max is, right? The heaviest weight you can lift for a particular movement for just one rep, and you can't do any more. That's the heaviest you can go. Uh, so you take your one rep max for bench press, squat, and deadlift. Add those three together, and that's your like total. And if those total a thousand pounds are over, congratulations, you're in the thousand pound club. You're pretty strong. There are some people that are in the one ton club. I don't know if any women have ever made it there, um, and a lot of men <laughs> struggle with it too. Like that's some like like hardcore shit. Like, that is, that's no fucking joke. I'm never going to be there. I'm going to say that outright. That ain't going to happen. I'm already 28 fucking years old, and I've been on and off of hormones for most of a decade now. It's not going to happen, um, especially because, like I said, raw strength isn't necessarily my sole focus. Um, so I don't see that happening, but the 1,000-pound club, I think it's doable. I'm already, my total is already in, like, the low 700s or something like that. Maybe, like, upper 600s. I don't know. Um, so I feel like I can pull that off, but it's going to take me probably a couple years at this rate. <laughs> I'm not making progress very fast again, probably because I'm just eating in a caloric deficit all the time. And so I'm kind of not necessarily, but it feels like I'm breaking my body down more than it can necessarily build back up. I mean, I'm recovering. I'm not like totally destroying myself with volume, but yeah, I think that, you know, my my lifts, you know, every couple of weeks, one of my lifts will go up by like five pounds. And that's about it. That's about the most progress I'm making at the moment. And yeah, I think that's partially a diet thing and partially also like I could probably have better programming with my training. But for as deep as, of a deficit as I feel like I'm in... You know, I, I don't see that being a fast process, but that is one of my goals. Um, another goal is a sub 30 minute 5k time. Right now I can do half of, well, a little over half of a 5k because I plotted a route through my neighborhood that's 0.85 miles for one lap. And I can run three laps of that in like 20 to 25 minutes, <laughs> which is not great. That's a little over half of a 5K in, like, the amount of time that it would take a decent runner to do a full 5K. So that kind of sucks. I would like to get a sub 30-minute 5K. That might happen at some point this year, um, considering it's only May, the beginning of May. But we'll see. Um, if I can get, like, a, like a sub 10-minute mile time, uh, like, fucking... Well, I guess if you were doing a sub 30 minute 5k, that would be a, I don't know. I, I can't remember the, <laughs> the conversion between kilometers and miles here. Um, anyways, yeah, just better running, not having to stop so much during my run would really do it. Um, cause that's my biggest problem. My actual running speed is not bad. I just can't keep it up for very long. <laughs> Like, I can't go a full mile straight without stopping unless I'm, like, going really fucking slow. So, yeah, I need to improve on that. That's one of my, like, goals that I'm focused on. I need to get into a more consistent training regimen with my MMA classes because I straight up haven't been to one in, like, a few weeks um, because my job had, like, a two-week shutdown. And during those two weeks, I went to, like... I can't remember, like, fucking 10 classes or some shit. 8 to 10 classes over the course of those two weeks, which was a lot. And I was still lifting. I was still doing other cardio calisthenics type shit at home. So I just, I fucking went all out and I was like, oh, this is going to be like a, like a fight camp for babies kind of <laughs> while I have these two weeks off. And that was great, but now that I'm back to work, like, considering I work nights and then, like, the, the class scheduling at the place that I train at... I'm just having a hard time, especially considering I've been struggling so bad with sleep. I'm having a hard time finding, like, my opportunities to go. Because I'll get home at, like, 7 in the morning, and I go to work at 9.30 p.m. And in that time, I need to get some sleep, 
I need to do any meal prep that I need to do, laundry, dishes, shopping, what have you. And then to throw in a class two, which like I'm going to have to because, you know, I worked the night before. So I really ought to shower before I go to class so that people aren't smelling my sweaty ass from work. But then when I get home from my class, I need to shower again before I go to work so that the people at work aren't smelling my sweaty ass from fucking Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu. And so it just becomes this whole thing where it, like overall, like sure, the class itself is only like half an hour. But as far as like prep work for the class... And then, like, coming home and, like, you know, I don't know how to put it. I feel like <laughs> debriefing is not the word, but it's the one I'm going to use because I'm blanking out. But all the, the unprep work after a class, all of this together takes up, like, a three-hour block for me, basically. Um, and it's hard to fit in, like, at least six hours of sleep. And then that three-hour block... For my class, basically, and, you know, that's also factoring in, like, getting ready for work and all that, plus any kind of cooking, cleaning, dishes, shopping, whatever I need to do on top of all that, when I have, like, 14 hours total between coming home from work and having to leave for work again, it's just a stretch, and I'm having a lot of days where I'll come home from work, I'll have my, my dinner quote unquote, at like 7.30 in the morning. And then maybe an hour later, I fall asleep. But I sleep for three fucking hours. And then I wake up and I cannot get back to sleep. So I end up doing everything I need to do for the day. And then like 6 or 7 p.m. rolls around and I'll take another nap for like an hour or two before I have to get back up to finish getting ready for work and then leave. And so I've been working on like four hours of sleep total per day. And that's just really bad. Like, it makes my panic attacks so much more likely to happen and so much worse when they do, which has been a real struggle for me since I moved up here for, you know, reasons I won't get into is a long fucking story. But it's just, it's really deteriorating my mental health. And also, I'm positive that it's part of the problem why I'm not seeing much gains very quickly with my weightlifting. Because your sleep... You know, it's not just about eating enough protein. You got to get enough protein, but also like your vitamins and minerals and shit. Carbs help too. And like basically as important as your protein intake is your fucking sleep. Maybe even more important. And my sleep sucks right now. Um, and I'm just struggling with that. I know a lot of people would suggest this or that, like do melatonin or whatever. I am not taking fucking melatonin because people have told me that it makes your dreams all kinds of weird and fucked up and vivid. And I already wake up in a cold sweat a lot of the time from a nightmare anyways. Like, I've, I'm notorious for having constant, horrible fucking nightmares. I do not see melatonin being a good addition to that. I mean, fuck it. I'll cut really quick, and I will tell the story of one of my nightmares for you so you can get a feel for, like, how fucking horrid they are. And keep in mind that the story you're about to hear, this nightmare that I'm about to describe is a regular sort of occurrence. Like, I don't have this specific nightmare as a recurring thing, but nightmares that are, you know, similar in scale and detail and shittiness as this one are just super common for me. I wouldn't say nightly, but, like, at least a few a month that I just wake up and I feel terrible all day because I saw something so bad in my sleep. Hey, my vegetables are done. I overcooked them a slight bit for what I intended. Oops. Anyways, so I had this nightmare when I was still in high school, um, <laughs> which again, I'm 28. So it's been a minute. My recollection is not going to be perfect here, but um, it's kind of a weird one. I'll give you that caveat immediately. Uh, it started out with me being like a soldier, um, presumably just an ordinary rifleman uh, in a sort of armor column with, you know, my unit or whatever. I've never actually been in the military, so please don't crucify me for not knowing what these terms mean. Um, <laughs> but it was clearly like an Eastern European thing. Like it looked like, honestly, it looks a lot like the shit in Ukraine right now, but like less built up, less modern. Um, and so 
it's me and a whole shitload of other guys, and we're in our fucking APCs. Like, honestly, they looked like BTRs or BRDMs or whatever. Um, those of you who are, like, tank nerds will know what I'm talking about. Um, and we're rolling through this beautiful fucking countryside. It looked like it was, like, late summer, early autumn. You know, there were still leaves on the trees, but they were clearly beginning to change colors. And, like, the fields just had wheat everywhere and, like, tall grasses. And it was fucking picturesque. It was beautiful. Aside from the fact that, like, first off, the, the, the sky was overcast and shitty looking. Um, you know, a very grim, bleak looking day. And especially considering we were rolling into, like, a village that had been essentially exterminated. Um, the buildings were still there, but, like, shit was on fire, there were bodies everywhere. And the problem is that this was essentially, like, a zombie scenario. But they were a really weird kind. Um, so one of the first things I saw as we were, like, rolling in, I'm sitting on top of one of these BTRs or whatever, um, you know, and I'm not the only one, there's other guys with me, um, and we're looking out into this field of wheat nearby, and stumbling oddly and disjointedly in the field is the body of a woman who had been killed in this situation, and <laughs> this is some odd wording here, um, she was clearly dead by the fact that she had no fucking head, um, <laughs> And so there goes, there goes one of your classic zombie tropes, destroy the head, doesn't work with these ones, unfortunately. She was stumbling in the field, like, with her arms out, like, kind of like she was trying to feel around. And just, like, you know, it looked like she was extremely drunk or something, but, you know, how coordinated are you going to be without a head? Um, and yeah, she was, she was in this beautiful, what would have been a beautiful, like, traditional sort of folk dress, like you know, kind of embroidered trim around it and everything, like ankle length. Um, it was like a, like a, a kind of a pastel green color, not necessarily that it had originally been dyed that color so much as like it looked like sun faded. Um, and, you know, a belt around the waist and everything, but it was, the front of it was just coated in blood. And she's just stumbling headless in this field. And so that was my first cue, of course, that something is terribly amiss here. Um, but my my unit, company, whatever, uh, had clearly already been aware of that. It wasn't a shock to us. And me and the dream, I just, you know, magically fucking knew somehow that, you know, this was a thing that was going on. So we keep on rolling into the town and we get to like a sort of center square area. Except square is a misnomer. It was more of like a roundabout almost looking thing. Um, except it's like fucking, the streets are like cobblestone. Um, but, and this is daytime, mind you, this, it, it felt like it maybe would have been around like noon, afternoon. Um, and in this, this central area in the village, this kind of open plaza a bit, were shitloads of soldiers, much like me and my buddies, that had been impaled. And they, too, were just coated in blood. But the problem was they were infected. Now, since they were impaled and in various stages of dismemberment, they were no threat. But they were sentient still. Like, these were not, like, dumb zombies, like, on Walking Dead or whatever. They were, like, making fun of us. Like, they were like, ah, you're gonna fucking die here and shit like that. And just, like, laughing at us as we drove by, even as they're immobilized on these fucking sticks that they've been impaled on. Um, they they found the whole thing fucking hilarious. And they were making fun of us as we drove by. So that was the second thing that was like, oh boy, what the fuck are we getting into? And these dudes are like, like I said, various stages of dismemberment and, like, guts hanging out and shit. Like, intestines flapping in the wind and... Crows pecking at them and shit, flies everywhere, and they're just they're just chilling, and they think it's fucking funny that we're gonna come into this village and die like they did. <laughs> um, so one of the burning buildings we eventually roll up on is a barn, and at this point we've dismounted. I don't remember if we left the APCs and shit in that plaza area or somewhere else, but I remember the barn being on the opposite fucking end of the village from where we came in and I'm on foot 
And I kind of stepped off a little bit alone. Some of you who have been in the military before, yeah, buddy system. This was a nightmare from a high school kid. So, you know, <laughs> give me a little wiggle room here. Um, and this barn was on fire and I could hear pounding on the door from inside and the voices of kids inside the barn yelling for help. And so, of course, the the fucking the immediate instinct for me is to run up and open the, the barn door and let these kids out that are calling out for help. But as soon as I open the door, like, you know, I get the, the fucking latch or whatever, and it just flies open. I'm knocked on my ass. And, of course, the kids are infected. It was a fucking trap. They just immediately run out of the door, and they're coming right for me. And so I fucking gunned them down. And that's the part that really fucked me up. I know that this is just a nightmare. It wasn't a real thing that actually happened. And they were zombies or whatever. But still, the mental image of opening fire on a burning barn full of children who were only seconds before calling for help really fucked with me for like a few days after I had that nightmare. I was not doing well after that one. That's one of the more mild ones. Um, you know, I've had nightmares that I'm probably never going to talk about. Because, like, somebody could probably interpret them as, like, threats on, like, actual real-life people or something. And I would never do the shit that I did in the one nightmare that I'm, you know, thinking about but I'm not going to describe. I would never in a million years do that. And I'm no longer in the position to where, like, you know, it was dependent on me living in a particular place with a particular set of people. I don't live there with those people anymore. Um, some of them also have moved multiple states away from where we had been living together before, but not the same state that I'm in now. So yeah, it, it, it couldn't happen. It would never happen anyways. There was never actually any genuine attention to, but it was still a nightmare that I was subjected to. Um, fuck it. Since I made that caveat, I'll just come out and tell you in the nightmare, <laughs> I was living at my parents' house with my at-the-time girlfriend, which, you know, that was not just part of the nightmare. At that time that I had this nightmare, I was living in my parents' house with my at-the-time girlfriend. So my nightmare just mirrored that reality. But in that nightmare, I got in a fight with my mother. And me and my mother don't get along in real life, like, badly. Uh, so this, again, was like, you know, it felt pretty personal and emotional. And, like, at some point during this fight, in the nightmare, like, I started choking her. But she, like, got out, like, a little bit of a scream, and my at-the-time girlfriend came running out of her room to see what was going on. The thing is, this girl in particular also has her own mental health struggles, and in the nightmare, she started having a panic attack and just completely fucking snapped, went off the deep end. Went back to my room and grabbed one of my guns and fucking just shot my mother, like, multiple times in the chest. My mom dropped dead, and my girlfriend dropped the gun and wandered off back to her room on the other side of the house. And at that point, I was just like, well, this is, this is the end right here. Like, I don't know how to proceed with life after this point. And so, in the nightmare, I went back to my room and I grabbed one of my guns. And I came up to my at-the-time girlfriend and I asked her, do you want it? And by it, there's a specific implication there. She said yes, and so I shot her and killed her. And I was just waiting there in my room. I guess I was waiting for the cops to show up or trying to work up the balls to kill myself. So that's the kind of nightmares that I have on a fairly regular basis. And it's been like that since I was in elementary school. Um, of course, they weren't as, like, detailed and complicated when I was in elementary school, but I still had some <laughs> some real bangers that were just slightly more cartoonish, a little more goosebumps. But at the time, when you're, like, eight years old, that's still kind of creepy. Um, so, yeah, I, that's, I, I don't feel like trying melatonin for my sleep issues. I don't feel like trying anything that's going to fuck with my dreams unless it's going to make me have less of them. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm going to have to figure out my sleep issue probably without any sort of pharmaceutical or supplement help. I'm going to have to just work on, like, I guess better sleep habits. You know, watch my caffeine consumption throughout the day and, like, 
you know, less screen time with my phone and my computer and everything and shit like that. I'm going to have to just figure it out. Um, I also need to get my, my fucking stress and anxiety under control because like yesterday, for example, I had a hell of a time getting to sleep yesterday because when I went to go to sleep, I started having a crazy fucking panic attack. And of course I can't just relax and fall asleep in the middle of a panic attack. So that kept me up for an hour or two longer than I intended to stay up. Um, so it's just, it's just shit like that. It's really bothering me. I need to get it under control. Um, cause all of this, the weights, the fighting, my job, losing weight, all of it, sleep is so vital. It's, it's a, it's a daily essential bodily function. Um, and you really hamstring yourself if you aren't sleeping for shit. So yeah, that's one of the things, <laughs> one of my more short term, like immediate goals is figure out my fucking sleep and start to control my anxiety a little better. I already mentioned the, you know, the 5k time and the thousand pound club and shit, more consistent training schedule, which will have to come after the sleep problem. That's about it. That's about all I've got on my plate right now. As far as like, you know, diet and fitness stuff goes, um, you know, on the, the grander scale of things, frankly, more important shit, uh, <laughs> You know, as much as I'm okay with my factory job, uh, I just, I need to be making more money. Like, my base pay right now is not bad. It's well above minimum wage. We'll say that. Um, but it's still, like, I just, I hate struggling. Like, I hate feeling like, you know, if I, if I want to eat some fucking, if I want to get like a salmon filet or something, I want to get a fucking salmon filet instead of feeling like, oh shit, that's pricey. I'm just going to have chicken breast for the 47th time this week. Um, <laughs> you know, shit like that. It's just, it sucks to feel like I'm in danger all the time. Like if something went wrong with my car right now, my parents would help me. But if I were in a situation where my parents would not or could not help me, I would be totally fucked. And that makes me uncomfortable to think about because I don't like accepting help from my parents anyways. Like the bad blood there and everything, it just makes me feel like a total piece of shit if like we don't have a good relationship and yet they still help me all the time. Like I would just be an asshole for that. Uh, so I don't like to accept help from them. Like I feel like if I'm going to accept their help, then I need to like, <laughs> you know, I don't know how to put it. Because there's a lot of shit in my past, I almost want to say let go, but it's shit that, like, I don't feel like I can let go. Like, you know, when I first came out as trans, my mom telling me that I was going to be stitched up and scarred like a Frankenstein monster. And nobody's ever going to love me. I'm just going to die alone. Like, why should I forgive her for that? Like, <laughs> that's a terrible fucking thing to say to your teenage kid. Um... So I feel, I feel justified in being salty. Um, and yet, I don't know. I feel like I get a lot of judgment for, for that too. Like from certain friends, like not all of my friends. Some of my friends have seen my mom's true colors and my brother now too, uh, has validated a lot of my feelings about how our childhood went. Because it used to be that I felt like my whole family and all of my friends and everybody basically were judgmental for me having conflict with my mother. And now like my brother is like, yeah, no, I don't know if I want to talk to her anymore. And I'm like, well, <laughs> now that you're in my camp, thank you for joining. Um, and some of my friends are starting to see that too. Um, so it's just been really weird for me, like seeing the switch between like other people starting to realize she's kind of fucked up. Versus me having known that all the time, but previously having been kind of gaslit by everybody into like feeling guilty for being angry at her for being genuinely shitty to me. Um, but I feel like, you know, for me to still be upset about that and to never want to necessarily forgive, you know, something that was just objectively a shitty thing to do, um for me to then also accept help without addressing that situation just feels like a total cunt thing to do. So yeah, I have, even when I've had moments when like, I'm not sure if I'm going to make rent and I'm like trying to donate plasma to make money and shit. Even then I don't, 
ask my parents for anything. <laughs> if, if something happened to my car, I would probably just lay down on the side of the road and wait for death to take me. <laughs> it's kind of where I'm at right now. It's not great. Um, so yeah, I would like to be making more money. I need to figure out I think what I'm going to do eventually is, like, I need to get into some kind of, like, a trade or something. Because I'm really just dumb as a fucking brick. So, like, computer shit, I've tried it before. I'm no fucking good at it. I don't get it. I really don't understand. Um, medical stuff would be expensive to get into because I wouldn't want to do, like, nursing because those are kind of horrible jobs, to be honest. Like, the overtime, the mandatory overtime is insane and you're underappreciated, and the pay isn't very good for what you're doing. Um, so if I went into the medical field, I would want to be, like, some kind of, like, imaging tech or something. Um, I could never afford to be a doctor. I'm going to say that right now. <laughs> like, I don't see that happening in a million years. I'm dumb anyways, but, yeah, I don't know. I feel like there's a barrier to entry there where you're dealing with, like, legit, like, bachelor, master's, whatever kind of degree before you really get much of anywhere too useful. Whereas like a trade, you know, doing like HVAC or carpentry or something, you know, you do, you get it like a fucking apprenticeship or something, a paid apprenticeship. You're still making money, just not as much while you're training. And then once you're done with your training, you're making good money. Um, I probably ought to do something like that. I've just never really decided like, which of the trades I would tolerate the best. The problem is I don't enjoy anything in life. Like there's, I don't experience happiness <laughs> for the most part. And so like, there's nothing, there's no thing on this earth that I could possibly make a living doing that I can sit down and think I would enjoy that. It's just different levels of like, what would suck the least? And I have still yet to figure that out. And so I've been just kind of, putting it off, procrastinating, making excuses, wasting time, spinning my wheels and stagnating, putting off this probably an inevitability that I need to just pick a fucking trade and go train in it. And quite frankly, I'm probably going to talk to my older brother about that because he and his wife have always had really good advice for like practical life stuff like this. They're really like down to earth street smart people in my opinion. He's like an he's like a fucking accountant. You know, he was the he was the successful one. I was the disappointment. Um, which is not me casting any resentment on him. I'm glad he's got what he has. Uh he fucking deserves it. But yeah, I, I look to him for advice on shit like that because I just genuinely feel like he knows better than me. So I need to talk to him and Megan about, you know, getting into like a trade thing and how would I do that without like you know, I don't want to take a massive pay cut moving from like a decent ish factory job into like a paid apprenticeship where the pay just isn't that great. I don't know what they pay anyways. Like I clearly haven't done enough research on this shit. Um, in any case, I'm probably just going to shut the fuck up now. I've given you the whole life update. You've seen the weigh in, a peek at what I'm eating. Uh, some explanations on my thoughts, my philosophies regarding the way that I'm programming my training right now, and a whole bunch of other shit. <laughs> you got a bit of a, a look into my shitty past. Um, you know, a lot of people have had it way worse than me, but I'm a pussy, so the sh petty things I went through were enough to break my poor little brain. Um, anyways, yeah, I need to finish cooking my fucking food. It's also, it's time for me to eat. I'm overdue. Uh, I'm hungry as fuck. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm losing weight again. That's exciting. We'll have to see how far it goes. I will say, before I actually shut the fuck up, I will say that I think I'm going to set my lower limit at uh, maybe 175. Because considering that at this point... Already, I've lost nearly 200 pounds. I'm like 15 off from having lost literally 200 pounds. Um, so I've got a lot of loose skin on me. I'm sure it's got to account for at least 10 pounds of my total weight, but it could be as much as 20. I'm not sure. I really don't feel like I have any way to know that without like, you know, 
getting some kind of a crazy fucking scan from a doctor or something. Um, so I think if I stop at 175, worst case scenario, I'm going to weigh actually 165 if you don't count the loose skin. Or I might be as light as like 155 or even 150 without, you know, if we, if we subtract just the weight of the loose skin. So, you know, going by like the BMI scale, you know, for my height, I'm about like 5'10", maybe a little taller. Um, you know, I'm 28. If I got down to, let's say, 155 without, you know, factoring in the loose skin, that's pretty fucking lean already. Um, you know, I carry a little muscle mass on me. Not like a whole lot, but like, I mean, shit. I don't know if you're going to see it very well. Not necessarily from that angle. This angle works better. Yeah, you can see my calves are like kind of not bad. And like my hamstrings. I've got a little muscle on me. It's not a whole lot, but it's something. And so that's going to, you know, if I got down to 155 without losing too much muscle mass, I would be lean as shit, I think. Um... And so, yeah, at that point, I mean, I can already kind of feel my ribs, like, for the first time ever. Like, I can kind of see them in the, you know, the just right lighting. I'm starting to get to the point where I can kind of see my ribs. So, I feel like I'm getting close to the point where I need to stop losing weight. Not quite yet, but I think once I get to 175, just as the scale reads, that's probably good enough because, you know you have to consider that I'm counting, I'm carrying an extra 10 to 20 pounds of loose skin on me. So that 175 is not the same as 175 for someone who is my height and age, but has been thin their whole life. At least that's what I think. I don't know. But yeah, there, there comes a point where there is such a thing as too skinny. Absolutely. And I do not want to get there. I especially don't want all of my muscle to waste away. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm eventually I'm going to have to find a place that's like a you know, a final like a stopping point like I have reached the goal and it's time to give it a fucking break. I need to do more work figuring out where should that be in terms of like a health standpoint. <laughs> and I need to stick to that like if I can even get there in the first place cuz it's been a lot of work to get to 194. It has been a lot of work. But if I do manage to get to 175 by some fucking miracle, then yeah, I really need to seriously consider just maintaining around that area long term. You know, maybe run a bulk cycle and then immediately after that go into a cut cycle, but then spend some time in the maintenance zone after that and just like, you know, feel things out, keep fucking current with my doctor shit like that and just like focus on my health because I do not I do not want to play around with the like sort of eating disordery mindset of just going as low as I can go like that is dangerous territory that is no joke um I do not want to go there but yeah that's that's about all I have to say I guess I need to finish cooking so I, I hope you've enjoyed this overly long video full of unnecessary bullshit that nobody wants to hear. <laughs> so when you, when you want to hear some more, I'll see you next time.